Hello, I'm going to try my second attempt at this. Um, this is my astro Astronomical Tools 2, Part 2. And uh, basically what I'm going to try to do in this one is to show you guys about spectrum uh, and how spectra can be used to tell uh, quite a few things about stars in terms of composition, temperature, pressure, um, as well as direction of motion and relative speed. Um, I will review the electromagnetic spectrum a bit here too talk about the Doppler effect uh, and what that actually tells us about stars and uh, finish off talking about galaxy, galactic motion and uh, Doppler effect and what it can tell us. But anyway, we're going to, um, my uh, earth science classes are going to be doing a spectroscopy lab fairly soon. Um, I'm going to be showing him gas tubes and uh, of known spectra and they'll look through a spectrometer to actually see the um, the uh, spectra that's actually given by elements, and you can see iron, calcium, sodium, hydrogen, helium, argon, mercury, and neon here. Um, these are the individual lines that actually show up as a fingerprint, fingerprint meaning that none of the elements have the same spectra. Um, these lines are all in different places. They can share positions, they can share um, locations, um, they can even share colors. Um, as you can see here, the colors of the visible spectrum, Roy G. Biv. Um, large wavelength um, is down here. Uh, this, this is uh, um, the 700 end, and this is the 400 end. Um, talking about uh, nanometers, um, which is on here, and you can see 700 plus. Um, this is the largest wavelength we can see. Get any bigger than that, we call it infrared, which is even more red than red. Um, we can't make out any of these, and as you can see, these wavelengths are getting larger and larger and larger. And then as it goes down from um, probably 800 nanometers, down through 7, 6, 5, and even less than 4, we go all the way to the purple end, or the violet end. Ultraviolet radiation being even more violet than purple, um, that's the most purple thing we can see. So we see this very small band here. <coughs> Excuse me. Just got back with a walk and it's uh, kind of cold outside. Um, but um, you can see that band located right there. There's a whole lot of the electromagnetic spectrum we cannot see and then there's that little part that we can. But anyway, they're going to be taking these spectra. Um, you can actually see the colors, um, argon, um, neon, purple, or indigo. Purple is, is actually my favorite color. Um, argon has a very purplish uh, tone to it. Um, and if you actually take a look at uh, the rest of these, you can make some in, um, idea of what color the light would be. And these are actually created by taking a piece of iron, putting it inside of a flame, put it on a candle. But putting it in there, I'm usually on a wire with a ring and putting it into a flame, probably like a Bunsen burner, and actually watching it ignite and give off light and then putting it through a spectrometer and you'd get these lines, visible colors. Um, you'd get red lines, you'd get two, a couple yellows, you'd get a green and some indigo. Um, which would actually show you the iron color. Do the same thing with a piece of solid calcium and you can get the calcium spectrum or the sodium or um, whatever kind you want. And you can do this with any element on the periodic table. What they're going to be given is they're going to be given spectra from four stars. Star A, B, C, and D. And what they're supposed to do is cut the star out, including the name, and then slide it across here. Now they actually, um, what's called the sodium doublet right here, and you can see they put the sodium doublet in each one of these spectra, and they're going to use that as their reference point to slide it across, and they're going to ask themselves, do these lines actually appear inside this star? If they do, this star would contain iron. If these go in there, um, it's calcium. If that's in there and they actually put the sodium doublet in there, so sodium is going to actually lo be located in all of them. But if these lines are in there, hydrogen's in there, if these lines are in there, um, helium is in there, if these lines are in there, argon would be in there, but can you actually tell that argon is not in that star? Um, it would have to have this big blob down there, and it would have to have that um, intense yellow 
spectral line right there. So it is not in that star. But they're going to figure that out for A, B, C, and D, and they'll find out the elements that are in there. But then they're going to look at these. We're going to call this one the norm. Um, the control, and they're going to look at star C and they're going to try to see if there's any difference. And if there is, um, what, does that what does that difference actually mean? And then they're going to look at star D, and if you line up that sodium doublet, um, maybe you can see that these guys don't seem to be in the same location. And it, they're supposed to go in here and color these. So they're supposed to go in and color these things to represent the colors so they can actually see one what shade these guys are because everything up here is purple everything down here is red everything in the middle of it would be green um, but so they can see that and then they can also see that these things if they are shifted are they shifted toward the blue end which is going to mean one thing or they shifted to the red end which is going to mean another Okay, so we've got all that in there. Um, we got that uh, spectral, we figured that one out. Now let's talk a Doppler. Doppler effect is, a, is an apparent change in wavelength due to motion. If you take a look at these, um, the two wavelengths, one moving toward the observer, um, you can see these lines, these waves are very tightly packed. Um, it's going to have a very high frequency, very short wavelength. Um, we call that a blue shift. And then the other observer um, that's moving away has this larger wavelength, lower frequency wave, which we call the redshift. Now the way I can sort of maybe explain this to you, if you see star 1, which is right there, star 1 is going to send out a light beam. It's going to travel in all directions, um, very similar to what you see star 4 doing right here. Star one is going to move from position one into position two and the next one it's going to do is it's going to actually spend a light beam that goes out here but what happens to one for one one is going to get bigger and then it's going to move to three three is going to actually produce a little light beam two will get bigger and one will get even bigger and then it gets to four and it'll produce one that looks like that twos let me pick a different color. Twos would actually be growing. Threes, even bigger. And four, even though it's still centered where star number one was, it's actually a huge circle. Okay, now let me get rid of those. Okay, so what's going on is they get crammed together and you can see one, two, three, and four are very close on this side. We call that a blue shift. And then on this other side, they're very, very far away. It's a red shift. So another way we can probably explain it, a car. It's horn. If you're in the car listening to this driver blaring on the horn, that horn is going to have one particular sound. It's not a, let's assume it's not one of the really funky horns. But it's going to have one particular sound. Then you have two observers. You have somebody that's down the street, the direction you're heading, and it looks like that person's walking in that direction. And you've got another person, not minding their um, what's going on, basically, but they're looking in that direction. This car moving in that direction, that horn sound is going to get compressed together in front, and it's going to be a much higher pitch sound. And the horn b behind it, because the motion is that direction, is going to stretch these out a lower pitched sound. So we have uh, something that's very high pitched and we have something that's very low pitched. We can tell that through the Doppler effect. And you've probably heard this with fire trucks or trains or um, horns or just car engines. Um, you, can, you can hear that very obvious. Okay, this one, um, this is talking about those electromagnetic spectrums. We have the very long wavelength on this side and we have the very short. Um, how long and how short these waves are big enough that you could actually put like the Empire State Building underneath it. These guys are so short that they can fit inside um, the nucleus of an atom and the electrons that are going around. They can actually make it right through. Um, theoretically going right through humans, right through the planet, um, right through lots of things.
But if you take a look at it in terms of altitude, radio waves make it all the way down from deep space all the way down to the surface of the Earth. Microwaves, a very short portion of it, makes it all the way down to the surface. But most of it, as you can see, doesn't. It gets absorbed in our atmosphere. Our atmosphere is transparent to radio waves. It's transparent to visible. It's transparent to the very large wavelength microwaves. But it's opaque to most of the microwave, all of infrared, all of ultraviolet, all of x-rays, all of gamma rays, they don't make it to the Earth. So if we want to study radio, we can put that radio up here in a satellite. Um, we can do it from an airplane, flying through the atmosphere. Um, we can do the same thing with microwaves, same thing with infrared. If visible, we can actually put our um, telescope all the way down at sea level, but remember the best place to put a telescope is on top of a mountain away from the city, also above all the clouds that are there. If you want to do ultraviolet, you're going to have to get a very high altitude satellite, X-rays, pretty high altitude satellite, gamma rays, high altitude satellite, even airplanes probably wouldn't make it up to that, that height. Okay, the last couple things. Have a star moving toward an observer. Um, what happens is the wavelength gets compressed, the um, frequency goes up, and we call this a blue shift. And then we have the other one. We've got this star, or in this case sun, moving away. It actually draws out the wavelength, making longer wavelength, making um, a lower frequency, and we call this a red shift. Now, what do I mean by blue shifting and red shifting? Um, blue shifting and red shifting doesn't actually mean that the color turns blue or red, and I'll show that to you in this next diagram. Um, but I do want to show you that if that star was located right there, it would actually produce this wave because it's old, oldest. And when it moves to the next location, it produces that wave, the next location, the next wave, the next location, the next wave, the next location, the next wave, and now it's making this wave. And as it moves, these will all get larger. Um, it'll always produce more waves, whether it be sound or light. But what happens is they get compressed on the front side, giving you a blue shift, and they get expanded on the back side, which gives you a red shift. Now what does this mean? This means we can tell what direction things are moving. Um, we can look toward the sun and watch Mercury and actually tell whether Mercury is on its, um, and let's say the Earth is here and this is a symbol for Earth. We can tell whether or not it's moving around the sun toward the Earth or we can tell if it's moving away from, uh, around the sun away from the Earth, whether it's blue shift, excuse me, yeah, blue shifted or red shifted. So we can actually tell all the planets are moving around in a counterclockwise direction, just like the Earth, which is moving around the Sun in a counterclockwise direction. We can watch Jupiter and see us getting closer to it and farther from it because we just watch the light. We watch the elements that come from those stars. We watch where the spectral lines are, and we see if they're more red or more blue than what they're supposed to be. Okay, this maybe will show it. Um, if you take a look at this, we've got four things. I'm going to call, and I don't want to use blue or red, um, I'm going to call this one position 1, this is position 2, this one is 3, this one up here is 4. Um, the star, a single solitary star, a galaxy, nice spiral galaxy, uh, smaller, appearing smaller spiral galaxy, and a really small spiral galaxy. Um, let's assume these guys are all the same size, and it is assumption. Galaxies are not all the same size. Some of them are huge even compared to other galaxies. Some of them are small compared to other galaxies. But let's say these three are all the same size, and this star is in a galaxy called the Milky Way, which we're located. And when we actually look at this star, we see the spectral lines for whatever element we're talking about. We see them set like this. And if you take a look at it, the purple one, um, this one right here, um, and then we have less purple and we have blue lines and we have green and yellow and orange and red. Okay, galaxy 2 
it's actually moving in a direction and what you do is you see these same exact lines but they've moved and they've moved to make them more red so this blue line that's down here is going to be less blue this bluish green is going to end up being green this greenish yellow is more yellow um, this yellow maybe into more orange and this orangish red into more red so that all the lines have moved just a little bit more toward this red direction and what that tells us is and actually I'm drawing them in the wrong one they've gone a little bit more into the red direction and what that tells us is this these stars are this galaxy and the stars in the galaxy are moving away so I'm going to call this moving away with the speed of one. Looking at this galaxy, you can still see the same lines, but they've moved even more. Some of the colors have actually gone from blue-green into like green-yellow, or they've moved from um, yellowish-orange into orange, or they've actually moved from sort of red into even more red. So I'm going to call this one Motion 2 because it looks like it's moving um, a little bit faster, maybe well, let's call this one motion three because it's uh, basically moving at the same distance which would put it there but it's a little more. And this one I'm going to call motion six. And these we have some vastly different colors. We've gone from the purples, whether it be kind of a purplish blue to purple purple. This one's actually moved all the way over to the green zone. It's moved that far. And what this tells us is this galaxy is moving at speed six. So this galaxy is moving away very, very, very fast. And what that does, that tells us if we're here and there's a galaxy right there, and there's a galaxy right there, and there's a galaxy right there, um, this galaxy is moving fast. The galaxy that's farther away is moving fast er, and this farthest away galaxy is moving fastest. So the farther the galaxy away it is, the more it's red shifted, the more it's red shifted, the faster it's moving away. So we can see that with galaxies. Here's another depiction. Um, we have a normal galaxy right here. They're not showing you any arrow. Um, this is the way the spectral line, and only one spectral line shows up, kind of a greenish, yellowish color. And then we have this one where the star is actually moving and you can't really see the arrow that well, but it's moving away from us and the green line is turned actually into the yellow. So it's moved more red and this is a red shift. Can't really tell if that's red, but that's supposed to be red. And then this one um, you can see is actually moving this direction. Um, it's moving toward the wavelengths are being smashed together where these were pulled apart and this is called a blue shift. Now do we see blue shifted objects? Um, our closest neighboring galaxy Andromeda is slightly blue shifted which means we are moving toward each other and um, I've actually heard that given in a couple hundred thousand million years um, our two galaxies will collide. It's going to be a totally cool thing to see Andromeda up in our sky. Very visible. Unshifted. This one shifts this way, not saying that they turn red, but the lines are more red than they should have been. And then we have this side, which is blue shifted, again, not being blue, but more blue than they were, going from red into like orange, that's more blue. Here's a website that actually will show you a, an animation. It's not the coolest animation, but what it shows you is a sun. and we've got a planet that's moving away around it in a counterclockwise direction. Um, this one you can see moving away, back around, and it's coming toward. And if you look at the lines, the lines are shifted this direction, which they're saying is more of a blue shift. So we get a blue shifted star. And then we get this other star, or this other picture where the planets come back toward, and this is called conjunction in between the two. That would be called opposition on the other side of but it's actually going to move in that direction and it's now moving away from the earth. Um, normal lines again are now more red shifted. And you can see this animation from here and again it's not the coolest animation I've ever seen but it may work. Okay well thank you much for uh, listening and uh, stop by and for more updates. I'll be posting more soon. Bye.